Good morning, everyone. I welcome all of you here to our service of worship here this morning at the Congregational Church of Amherst United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I am the Reverend Maureen Prescott. I'm the senior pastor here at our congregation and joining us in worship this morning is the Reverend Kate Kennedy, our associate pastor, our wonderful musical team of Michael Havey and Sarah Phelps. We have our chancel choir, a recorded piece uh, that was recorded before we stopped meeting due to COVID-19 and they will have our anthem later on in the service. Our liturgist this morning is Jana Howe and we welcome all of you who are joining us here in worship from near and far, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube or on our website. We invite you to comment below if you're on Facebook, especially to let us know you're here and participate in our worship. And you can go over to our website to download the bulletin or to submit a prayer request or to see some of our previous services as well. Now today is Transfiguration Sunday. This is the Sunday where we mark the transition between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent, where we begin that journey towards the cross. And this is the story which we're gonna hear a little later on where Jesus goes up the mountain with a few of his disciples in tow and they witness him transfigure or change right before their eyes. And they begin to see him in a new way as they prepare themselves for this journey towards the cross and Jesus reveals this journey to him as well, to them as well. And this is a journey that we're being asked to follow alongside Jesus. This journey of risk and transformation and new life in service of our God. So now I want to have a reminder right now for uh, one of our announcements, a reminder that um, Blankets for Brutes, we're doing this during the month of February, and this is a church world service offering that we do at this time of year in February of every year. And we're calling it Blankets for Bruce because it was near and dear to the heart of the late Bruce Beckley, a beloved member of our congregation. He used to stand up in front of us in this cold sanctuary in February and wrap himself in this blanket and tell us about how good blankets like this do for people around the world, how church world service um, uh, donates them to people who have been displaced from their homes or who have been uh, experienced a natural disaster. It can be used as a blanket, as a tarp, as a ground cover. Uh, so we are taking donations during the entire month of February to help pay for these blankets for church world service. It's $10 for one blanket, $50 will buy blankets for an entire family. So you can send in a check to our church with uh, church world service or blanket in the memo line. You can go to our website to donate directly there, or you can go to the church world service website and donate there as well. Worthy cause in memory of Bruce. Also this week, we begin the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday. That's this Wednesday, February 17th, and we'll have an online worship service at 7 p.m. And you're all invited to attend that service. And you may have already received in the mail a postcard letting you know about all the things we have going on during the season of Lent right up to Easter Sunday. And with that postcard was a little package of ashes that we're inviting you to um, put on yourself or on your family members as you watch the service. And there'll be a time in the service when we do that together as we mark the transition time from Ash Wednesday into the season of Lent. So please join us for that service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday if you can. Also, after worship today at 11 a.m., we have our Zoom coffee hour, our Zoom fellowship. Um, you're invited to join us for that, for informal conversation, just to check in and see how we're all doing as we continue to be in this time apart. So please join us for that. And let's continue now in the spirit of worship.
I invite you now to, wherever you are, at home or out in the world, to stand as you are able as we join together in the call to worship, the prayer of invocation, and the Lord's Prayer. The mountaintop, the shining face, the glowing clothes, the voice of God speaking from the cloud, the commandments etched in stone. Sometimes God shows up in ways we cannot deny, in a place we can go, a light we can see, a voice we can hear, a stone we can touch. Sometimes. And sometimes there is the veil, the overshadowing, terrifying cloud, the questions, the appearing and disappearing, the excitement, the wondering, the silence. Sometimes God shows up in ways we cannot deny. Always God shows up somehow. And so we have shown up here now, and may God give us eyes to see. Let us pray. God, you bring us together in this place. We come to be fed, to be renewed, to seek understanding. God, you challenge us in this place. We embrace the challenge, trusting that through challenge we grow in faith. God, you are revealed in this place, sometimes in shining glory, sometimes in tears and struggle. God, as we worship in this place, refresh, renew, and challenge us so that we would see your awesomeness. May your spirit move among us now, O oh God, as we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, children of God. Do you know what today is? Okay, yes, it is Valentine's Day. And I bet you are thinking that I'm going to talk about the love of God. Well, don't worry, we will talk about that next week, so stay tuned. But today I wanna to talk about the other thing that is today. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. Now, transfiguration, I can't even say it, is a big word, right? But it means something pretty simple. Transfiguration means change. And in our passage today, Jesus changed the way the disciples could see him so that they would really know that Jesus was God's son and that their ministry together with Jesus was real and not something that someone else had made up. Now, in our story this morning, Jesus did this for the disciples in a way that they would really understand super well. He brought three of his closest disciples, Peter and James and John, to the top of a mountain. And right before their eyes, his robes turned a dazzling white, and then two other people appeared out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah. Peter and James and John would have absolutely known who Moses and Elijah were, and they would have been in awe of all three of them. They were, Moses and Elijah were holy ancestors. And as the stories went, they were deeply connected with God. So while maybe dazzling white robes and two guys appearing out of nowhere might not indicate to us that Jesus is the son of God, it did a good job to make that really clear to Peter and James and John. It did a very good job, actually. Then they really understood kind of what the ministry was about for a little bit there. They needed to see Jesus in a way that made sense to them to understand that Jesus was special and holy. And guess what, children? It's not just the disciples that need to see Jesus in a new way or in a different way to see the God within him. 
everyone connects with a different version of Jesus. And here, I'll show you. I have some pictures here because there are a lot of different images of Jesus over time. So this is the oldest picture of Jesus that we have. You can probably see it there. It's maybe not the oldest one ever, but it's the oldest one we can put our hands on. And so you can kind of see him there. It looks sort of old school, right? Now I'll show you these two pictures. These are the Hollywood Jesuses. I'll, I'll show them to you here and here. These are not super historically accurate, but they're the way that the movies have shown us Jesus over time. And maybe these are familiar pictures to you. Now this, this one is an African Jesus. This is a depiction from a different culture than ours. And this picture of Jesus was generated by AI. Do you know what AI is? It's artificial intelligence. And this is the closest thing that we've got to what the real Jesus might have looked like. And this one is called the laughing Jesus. I like this one. I think he looks really friendly in this picture. So these are just a couple of ways that people have depicted Jesus throughout history. But there are so many more than this just couple of pictures. You can Google um, when you get home, or I guess you are at home. You can go on the computer and Google images of Jesus, and you'll see all sorts of different kinds of pictures pop up. All of these images of Jesus have changed the way that people see him and understand his message and his work here on earth and his relationship with God in heaven. And it helps them think about how they relate to Jesus. And in each one of these images and so many more, people have understood how Jesus is God's son and the holiness of Jesus in new and big ways. So your assignment this week, outside of Googling other people's images of Jesus, is to find a quiet moment and sit down and draw, or you could write or paint or maybe make with clay, however you want to express yourself, the way you see Jesus and the way that you see God in Jesus. So go ahead and do that. And if you do that, please send me a picture. I would love to see your creations. But for now, let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for all the ways that you show yourself to us, whether it's through the Bible or through prayers or in the faces of one another or in the pictures that artists have created over time. In any way, may we see you everywhere that we go. Amen. Okay, my friends, it is time. It's this time that we get to every week where we pass the peace. Now this week, my invitation to you is to pass the peace to someone you haven't passed the peace to in a long time. So maybe that'll be a text or a phone call, or maybe you can start writing a little note and share the peace of God with one another. All right, so let me, let's say together, may the peace of God be with you. And also with you, my friends, now send it out into the world.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Now, a few weeks ago, we talked about how the Gospels we have in our New Testament were not written as biographies of Jesus. Rather, each is a collection of short stories. And each short story is designed to tell the listener or the reader one of three things. Who Jesus is, who God is, and what the good news is. Now, within that framework, the transfiguration story that Mark includes in his gospel and that Matthew and Luke copied nearly word for word in their gospels stands as a pivot point or major reveal within the Jesus story. Now, Mark reveals Jesus' identity in every story that he's told up to this point, from the opening paragraphs where John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River and God says, this is my beloved son, to Jesus resisting the temptation of of Satan in the wilderness, to the calling of the first disciples who drop their fishing nets without question to follow this man who promised them so much. Now at this point, Peter, James, and John, the first disciples to be called, have seen Jesus walk on water, heal the sick, cast out demons, calm a storm, feed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread. They've even witnessed him bring a young girl back to life from the dead. Now, just a few paragraphs before the passage that we're about to read, Jesus asked his disciples point blank, who do you say that I am? And with their heads still spinning with all these miraculous images, they answer, well, others think you are a great prophet like Elijah or John the Baptist, but we know that you are the Messiah. In other words, Jesus was the one that their people had been waiting for for thousands of years, the one God had anointed to vanquish their oppressors and lead them to freedom, to be the great nation that God had chosen them to be. And Jesus knew that his disciples had no idea what kind of Messiah that he would turn out to be. So for the first time, Jesus lays all his cards out on the table and tells these men who gave up everything to follow him that he was destined to suffer and to die at the hands of their oppressors. But the good news is that he would rise again and that the day of liberation would one day come. But first, The disciples must pick up their own cross and give up their own lives and risk it all to gain the new life and freedom they were seeking. Now, if we can imagine how we might react to having our hopes dashed in this way, we may understand why the disciples did not hear this news that Jesus shared with them well. They likely stopped listening after he mentioned the part about his suffering and dying. And Mark tells us Peter pulled Jesus aside and rebuked him. And we don't know what Peter said or what tone he took, whether he was angry or confused or disbelieving. Whether he said, Master, this cannot be true. Or he said, Master, this cannot be true. Or he said, Master, this cannot be true. Regardless of Peter's words or tone, the next thing that Jesus did was to bring him and James and John to the top of a mountain where they would see him transfigured before their eyes. Now it's important to note that Jesus was not transformed Who he was and what he was did not change. Instead, he was transfigured. It was how he appeared to others that changed. 
His disciples were meant to see him and what he had come to do in a new way. So they might see their role in the story in a new way as well. So let's listen to the story of the transfiguration from the Gospel of Mark. And listen also for the word of God. Six days later, <clears throat> Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. If you close your eyes and conjure up an image of Jesus, whether you're in the mix of prayer or listening to scripture being read during worship, or in need of a comforting or strengthening presence in the moment, what do you see? Who do you see? Now, in 1972, director Norman Jewison was casting the movie version of Jesus Christ Superstar, which was based on the hit Broadway musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, when it was suggested that he consider actor Ted Neely for the role of Jesus. Now, you may recognize him from one of the pictures that Pastor Kate held up during the children's sermon. Now, Neely had portrayed Jesus in the Los Angeles stage version of the show, a part which he, which he had stumbled across rather unexpectedly, because Neely had originally auditioned for the part of Judas, because he saw Judas as a complex character who was so often misunderstood. But he didn't get the part. Instead, he was cast as the understudy to the actor who played the role of Jesus. And then one night when that actor was unable to perform, Ted Neely stepped in and brought the house down with his falsetto rock opera voice and his very human portrayal of Jesus. But when it came to casting the movie, Neely, who was only five foot six inches tall and who described himself as a bow-legged drummer from Texas, was not even considered for the role. In fact, the roles of Jesus and Judas had already been cast when director Norman Jewison reluctantly agreed to allow Neely to do a screen test as a favor for a friend. Now, Neely brought along a good friend of his own, Carl Anderson, who played Judas in the L.A. stage production of the play, and together they performed the scene and musical number known as The Argument, where Jesus and Judas angrily sing back and forth at one another and painfully come to the conclusion that each has failed to live up to the image of the other and the expectations of the other. Now, after seeing the very real relationship and emotional connection that these two men brought to the roles, Jewison decided that he had found his true Jesus and Judas, and he cast both men in the movie. Now, Ted Neely went on to reprise this role in multiple stage revivals of Jesus Christ Superstar over the last 40 years. And while some fans of the production still think Ted Neely is too short to be a convincing Jesus, there are many who think that G Neely is the face of Jesus. In fact, Neely says some fans are so convinced that he is Jesus or is channeling the spirit of Jesus 
that after meeting him in person and receiving a hug or a handshake, they claimed they were miraculously healed of their affliction or even cured of their cancer. Now we all have our images and expectations of who Jesus is and was and will be. And that image may have changed for us over the course of our lives. We may see Jesus as a wise teacher or a rebel rabbi or a prophetic visionary. We may see him as a courageous revolutionary, a champion of social justice or a prince of peace. We may see him as the son of God or the redeemer of humanity, the savior of the world. Or we may see him as a confidant, a comforter, a healer, a beloved brother or companion or friend. Now we can't know for sure who the disciples saw when they looked at Jesus. This man who caused them to cast down their nets and cast aside their families and all that they knew when when he called after them and said, follow me. Now, when Jesus asked his followers, who do you say that I am? Peter responded, you are the Messiah. But the Jewish people of Jesus' time had many different understandings of who the Messiah was meant to be. The great prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah spoke of this Messiah, this anointed one who is destined to be sent by God to liberate the people of Israel from oppression and lead them to greatness. But some believe the Messiah would be a great judge who would guide the people towards freedom and justice with strength and compassion and wisdom. And some believe the Messiah would be a great warrior who would lead the people in a revolution, overthrowing their oppressors with violence if necessary. It's believed that Judas fell into this camp, which explains his great disappointment when Jesus failed to live up to this image. Now others believe the Messiah would be a great king, would either be born of royalty or enter poverty or descend from the clouds above and usher in an age of prosperity that would break the cycle of oppression that the people of Israel seem to perpetually endure. But it's likely no one in Jesus' time believed that the Messiah was destined to suffer and die before any resurrection or liberation or redemption could take place. Looking back from our time, we can place Jesus' death and the accounts of his resurrection in a theological or historical framework that helps us to understand or explain how and why it happened. Whether we see it as part of a divine plan or the result of human fear and failings or a combination of the two. We may see that Jesus came to break the cycle of redemptive violence that perpetuates this belief that justice demands retaliation, that war brings peace, that might makes right. But in the moment when James and John and Peter were looking into the face of Jesus as he revealed that he would suffer and die at the hands of their oppressors, this was not the kind of savior that they were prepared to see. And this was not the fate for their beloved teacher and friend that they wanted to see. It just didn't make sense. And it was too painful to even consider. And it placed too much hope and trust in a resurrection that for many was too far-fetched to believe. And then there was the part about Jesus' followers having to pick up their own cross and lose their own lives before liberation would truly come. In the moment, Jesus or James and Peter and John may have looked into the face of Jesus and wondered if they were still looking to the face of their Messiah, 
of their Savior. And if this was truly the path that they had signed up to walk when they dropped their nets and gave up all they had. It would take a trip up a mountain, the appearance of a few long dead prophets, a dazzling white light, and a booming voice of God from above to convince them otherwise. Now, the Transfiguration may be one of those stories we read in our Gospels that we read and we find ourselves wondering, did this really happen? Perhaps because we can't find a rational explanation for it. And in this instance, we can't imagine putting ourselves in the disciples' shoes. We can't imagine in what ways Jesus' appearance would need to change for, for us to begin to see and understand him differently than we do now. So let's go back to the image that comes to your mind when you think of Jesus. You may picture the illustrations you saw in the children's Bibles of your youth, or the paintings from Renaissance artists that are found on museum walls or the images we've seen in icons or statues or stained glass windows, or the traditional yet cheesy portraits that we see stitched on throw pillows or posted on billboards or shared in internet memes. Now, most of these images are now considered problematic because we recognize that the traditional images of Jesus that many of us grew up with that portrayed Jesus as a decidedly Western European looking man with fair unweathered skin and blue eyes and Caucasian features and long straight hair is likely far from what Jesus would have actually looked like as a brown skinned, dark eyed Middle Eastern Jew who lived a hard life in a desert climate. And despite the images burned in our brains from Jesus Christ Superstar, it's highly unlikely that Jesus looked anything like actor Ted Neely. Although Jesus was likely just as short in stature, given the average height of our first century ancestors. But perhaps this is the transfiguration example that we've been looking for. You may have seen this image which was produced some 20 years ago and appeared in newspapers under the title, Is This the Face of Jesus? This image was produced by a British forensic artist who took an actual skull found in a first century Palestinian settlement and using computer imagery and what we know about how people wore their hair and the effects that a hard life under the desert sun can have on human skin, he came up with this image of what a man in Jesus' time of Jesus' age may have looked like. Now, this image was derided when it first came out because many said it looked like a cab driver from New York City or something you'd see in a Neanderthal exhibit in a museum. Or shockingly, some claimed it looked like the face of a terrorist. And with our stereotypes and prejudices and assumptions in the mix, if it's more likely we see the face of Jesus in this image than we see in this image, then we may need to witness a transfiguration of our own. For some of us, it doesn't matter what Jesus actually looked like, and we see no harm in images of Jesus that reflect reflect a variety of races, if it creates an entry point or a sense of comfort for those seeking his presence. But what other images of Jesus do we have that are in need of transfiguration? Is it an image of Jesus who loves and accepts us just as we are, and therefore never challenges us to acknowledge our biases, our blind spots, our brokenness. 
Is it an image of Jesus as a constant purveyor of hope and healing and joy who causes us to feel shame if we're unable to free ourselves from our pain, our grief, or our despair? Is it an image of Jesus who promoted peace and harmony over conflict and therefore would never have flipped over tables in anger over an injustice? or instructed his followers to turn the other cheek as an act of civil disobedience, or call for those who abused their power to be brought down from their thrones? Is it an image of Jesus who called for us to follow in his footsteps, to care for the poor, and feed the hungry, and welcome the stranger, and love our neighbor? as long as doing so doesn't raise our taxes or deplete our resources or put the interests of other nations before our own or ask us to show compassion for those seeking asylum at our borders. There are images of Jesus that we carry that are in need of transfiguration. And these images are rooted in our own need for transformation. I invite all of us to follow pa Pastor Kate's suggestion that she had for the children earlier and Google images of Jesus. You may just be surprised by what you find, what new images may resonate with you, what old images you may be ready to leave behind, what images that others have that disturb you or challenge you or inspire you or transform you. Regardless of what we find when we come down off that mountain, may we do so with our eyes opened to the path we're called to follow as a people created in the image of God. Thanks be to God and amen.
My friends, we have come to the time in our service where we lift up all of the prayers that are swimming around our spirits this week. Um, so I invite you to find a place of prayer that is meaningful for you. However that looks, whatever that feels like in your spirit, take a stance of prayer that helps you tune in to this moment and tune out all the rest. I invite you to join me now in prayer. Gracious God, today on this Valentine's Day, we lift up prayers of thanksgiving for our deacons who have reached out to our congregation throughout this season by organizing a church-wide note writing project to keep us connected. We are thankful for one another, each of us who is still a member and friend of this congregation, even while we have not literally congregated since last year. We lift up thanks for the growing bond among us, and we ask that we continue to grow in our spiritual and relational gifts, even when we are back together. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in our congregation who are at the beginning of a health struggle. We pray that they find a smart and decisive team that will help them through this in body, mind, and spirit. We pray for those in the middle of the journey that they may stay the course and feel your everlasting presence when things are gray and solutions seem far away. And we pray for those concluding a, me a medical struggle, that with the conclusion comes wisdom, a new understanding of God's abiding love and wholeness of spirit. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today continued prayers of bereavement for Connie Spargo's family. Connie Spargo was a longtime member of our congregation who passed away a few weeks ago. The family has decided to have a Zoom memorial service so that all can be included in celebrating Connie's life. And that service will be held on February 27th. And the Zoom link will be sent out to the congregation. We lift up continued prayers for Connie's family and friends as they mourn her passing. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Chris and Vern Trudeau, who both had a fall last week but are doing fine. Both were hospitalized for a day and have some soreness, and they both appreciate our prayers for them during this time. We lift up ongoing prayers for their health concerns. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Heather McDonald's sister-in-law, Janice, who is in the hospital. Prayers for Janice's health concerns, that they may be resolved quickly under God's care. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ongoing prayers of healing and hope for Kathy Johnson's dad, Roy, Sue, Sue Holden, Carolyn Mitchell, all those in our congregation who have come down with COVID-19 and their family members, and all those beloved by this community with ongoing health concerns. May they feel the warm embrace of God. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up those in our country who have been victims of anti-Asian hate crimes over the past year. We pray for those who have been hurt and killed by these acts of racism and hate and for their families. We also pray for those who are the perpetrators of such violent acts. May the fear that we all feel in the face of this virus only make us more open-hearted towards one another. And may racist rhetoric that the racist rhetoric that fuels these crimes be condemned. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, beloved, we lift up all of those prayers that we just are holding quiet in our spirits.
God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we come before you having just climbed part of the mountain. We look ahead and see that this is more of, there is more of a climb to go before we are dazzled by your divine truths. In many ways, our loads are heavy with worry, with regret, with fatigue and illness, with despair for all in the world that is hurting, in danger, in bondage, and more. And in many ways, our loads are lightened by our hopes and our joys, by our loved ones and friends, by all that is good and beautiful in this world that you made. And so whether we feel burdened down or light on our feet, we all follow you, stumbling, hoping, praying, sometimes feeling nimble with awe, skipping to the top, and sometimes breathing hard with hearts pounding, not knowing if we can make it on our own. But then we remember we are not alone. So lead us, Lord, to the top of that mountain where we might be astounded by your light, lifted by what is divine, feel filled by the sheer delight of what is mystical and magical and grounded and real. We pray this for ourselves, for one another, and for the world in which we live. Amen. Some of you may have seen the article in this month's uh, newsletter of our congregation written by Paul Spies, uh, recognizing the 20th anniversary of Parkhurst Place. Now, Parkhurst Place is a 42-unit independent living facility here in Amherst for low and moderate income senior citizens. It's funded by the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and subsidized through low-cost financing and federal rental voucher programs. Now, what you may not know is that the idea and energy behind the building of Parkhurst Place came from within our own congregation. Now, Paul recalls that a little over 22 years ago, he got a call from Pastor David Taylor, who was the minister of our church at the time, asking if he could stop by for a chat. And the conversation started off with a simple question. Pastor David asked Paul, what do you see as missing in our community? Paul said he took a few minutes to think about it, but then quickly responded, we're missing public housing for our senior citizens. Paul explained that the senior citizens who own houses in Amherst face high taxes relative to their income and continual maintenance expenses on their homes. And they are left with few choices. Either they sell their homes and move in with family or they move out of town to find lower cost housing. Our community was in need of alternative housing for our seniors. Now, after hearing this, Paul says Pastor David asked him a gotcha question. He said, what if we provide the leadership and do it ourselves? And this was the moment that the Sauhegan Valley Interfaith Housing Corporation was born. A small but dedicated people, group of people from within our church formed the nucleus of the planning and the development team that it eventually included four area churches and a board of 12 individuals of varying backgrounds and experiences. The group spent two years learning and visiting senior housing projects, searching for a potential development site, and meeting with staff at the housing authority, and finding an experienced developer, an architect, and builder. No small task for a group of church volunteers. Now, the group was fortunate to find a property owned by Howard Parkhurst, a local farmer and jack-of-all-trades, as Paul describes him, who agreed to sell his land once he learned what the group had intended to do with it. So construction was started in the fall of 2000, and Parkhurst Place opened for occupancy in the spring of 2001. 
Now here in 2021, as we continue to expand our outreach into our local communities here in Amherst and Milford and Manchester and Nashua, helping organizations like SHARE and End 68 Hours of Hunger and Sleep and Heavenly Peace and Families and Transition, the Pass Along Project, Bethany Christian Services, and the Michael Stephen Boyd Memorial Foundation. We help them in their efforts to serve our neighbors in need. But we may wonder what our Parkhurst place might be. What might we do to fill in a gap or meet a need or serve a population that is often overlooked in our community? What gifts and skills and resources do we have that may help us serve our neighbor and our God, either by partnering with a, an existing organization or launching a new ministry of our own? What are the possibilities that we may come to see once we open our eyes to where God is leading us? So in gratitude for all of our ministries, past, present, and future, we now receive our morning's offering and lift up this prayer of dedication. Living God, your love for us is so unfathomable. Open our ears to hear the cries of your children in need. Open our eyes to see human injustice. Open our hearts to feel compassion for all circumstances. Continue to increase our willingness to give so that we may lead lives fully focused on ministry to others. We place these offerings upon your altar in gratitude for your guidance, your grace, and your love. Amen. People of God, as we conclude our time together in worship here this morning, I invite us all to go out into the world now in peace, to hold on to what is good, to have courage, to return no evil for evil, to help the suffering, strengthen the faint-hearted, welcome the stranger, Rejoice in hope and come down off that mountain with a new understanding of who Jesus is in our lives and where we are being led by God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.